Hometown Ghost Stories contains serious and often distressing events and is not intended for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. I had heard of rumors about room 305 at the Monte Vista Hotel in Flagstaff, Arizona. People spoke of an old woman's ghost, a grieving mother who awaited her long lost son's return. They warranted that she guarded her rocking chair with a vengeance, and anyone who dared to disturb it would face her wrath. But being a skeptic, I dismissed the tales as mere superstitions. Ghosts? Hauntings? It's all nonsense to me. One night, I embarked on a road trip. I found myself seeking shelter at the historic Monte Vista Hotel. The front desk clerk handed me the key to room 305, a seemingly ordinary room with an extraordinary reputation. Little did I know, my beliefs would soon be challenged in the most unsettling way. As the hours slipped away, the charm of the hotel began to sway my skeptical heart. The creaking floors and the vintage decor evoked a sense of nostalgia, enticing my imagination. It was as though the hotel itself whispered stories of days long gone. Yet, I remained unyielding, determined not to succumb to the allure of the supernatural. Nightfall cast a veil of darkness upon the hotel, and I retired to my room, finding solace in the stillness. A dim light spilled from the bedside lamp, illuminating the worn-out rocking chair near the window. Its inviting presence seemed to beckon me, daring me to challenge my disbelief. Perhaps out of curiosity or simply to test my resolve, I approached the chair, my hand hovering above its armrest. A sudden gust of wind rustled the curtains, sending shivers down my spine. The room grew eerily silent, as if holding its breath, but I refused to be swayed by mere coincidences or the power of suggestion. I scoffed at the notion that a ghostly presence could inhabit this space. With a defiant smirk, I finally succumbed to the temptation and allowed my fingers to brush against the armrest. That moment, the air turned icy chilling me to the core. The atmosphere crackled with a malevolent energy, and the room seemed to come alive with unseen eyes watching my every move. A sorrowful voice whispered in my ear, or maybe it was in my head, but it sent a shiver down my spine. Leave my chair be, for it is reserved for my son's return. Do not awaken the spirits that dwell within. My heart raced, and beads of sweat formed on my brow. The truth I had stubbornly denied was now staring me in the face. Panic clawed at my chest as I scrambled backwards away from the chair, and now it seemed imbued with an otherworldly presence. The whispers grew louder in my head, the voice more insistent, as if pleading with me to understand the pain that lingered within these walls. My skepticism shattered like glass, and I trembled with fear and disbelief. The room gradually returned to normal the air calming as the spectral presence retreated. I sank onto the bed, my mind reeling from the encounter. What had I just witnessed? How had my reality shifted so abruptly? From that night forward, I became a believer, forever changed by whatever was haunting room 305. I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Flagstaff, Arizona. In 1880, the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad began laying down track from Albuquerque on its way to California. Merchants set up shop along the work site and capitalized on the opportunity to sell the railway construction crews food, supplies, and provide entertainment. As the rails got closer to the San Francisco peaks, a settlement began to take shape on Mars Hill, which is just west of what we now know as downtown Flagstaff, Arizona. By the end of the following year, Over 200 people lived in Flagstaff, and it quickly turned into a wild railroad town filled with gambling houses, saloons, and dance halls. As the railway moved through Flagstaff, some followed the construction crews, but many saw opportunity in the small, rowdy town and stuck around to see it thrive. And they were right. Flagstaff continued to grow and became an established stop for water servicing the railroad and its passengers. 
Sheep ranchers used the trains to transport wool, and cattle ranchers used it to ship their beef to market. By the winter of 1882, Flagstaff was firmly established, with merchants, the railroad, livestock, lumber mills, saloons, and hotels. In 1884, a fire ripped through Flagstaff, causing a ton of destruction. They would rebuild the town about 500 yards away, using fire-resistant red sandstone as the foundation for many of the buildings. They called this area Newtown and the burnt-down area Old Town. A post office was built in 1884, and the name Flagstaff was reinstated. The railroad had largely controlled Flagstaff up until this point, as it was the main source of industry and transport. That is until 1926, when Route 66 was completed. By 1928, the town had grown to over 3,000 residents and was seeing a massive spike in tourism. The Weatherford Hotel In 1886, John Weatherford, a young deputy, rode into Flagstaff. He had spent most of his life going back and forth from Tombstone, Arizona to Mexico, where he sold mining equipment. He was a successful merchant and settled down in Flagstaff with his wife. He worked as a merchant in addition to serving as Justice of the Peace, advocating for the creation of a college which would later become NAU, and he began construction on the Weatherford Hotel, which was originally a two-story structure. It included a large retail store on the ground floor and an apartment for him and his wife. He would quickly add hotel rooms in a restaurant and open the hotel doors on New Year's Day 1900. Today the Weatherford still stands and is a historic landmark in Flagstaff. It hosted the likes of Teddy Roosevelt and William Randolph Hearst. It would eventually expand and house a theater and billiard hall. The hotel would fall into decline during the Great Depression and after a fire in the late 1920s. By the 1950s, the building was in rough shape and was almost bulldozed and turned into a parking lot. But the new owners would work hard refurbishing the building. They turned the Weatherford into a hostel, and by 1979, the building landed itself on the National Historic List, protecting it from being demolished. According to legend, in the 1930s, a couple was murdered in room 54 of the Weatherford Hotel while on their honeymoon. Multiple people have claimed that while staying in this room, they wake in the middle of the night to find the ghost of a bride and groom standing at the foot of their bed. These ghostly sightings became so frequent that the hotel changed room 54 into a storage closet. But this hasn't stopped the hauntings. Guests and staff have heard their names called out by an unseen spirit on the fourth floor, and they claim to feel a presence standing behind them. Doors on the third floor have been known to lock and unlock on their own, and if you stop outside the storage closet, you may just hear eerie music coming from within. In 2005, a hotel guest plunged to her death after attempting to climb from her hotel window to the Zane Grey balcony. There were no witnesses, but the tragedy was captured on video surveillance. With the existing hotels outdated and falling apart, demand for a new hotel grew in Flagstaff, Arizona in the 1920s. Fundraising began in April of 1926, and within one month, $200,000 was raised by prominent citizens, assisted by a substantial donation from novelist Zane Gray. Construction on what was called the Community Hotel began on June 8, 1926. The hotel boasted 73 rooms, incorporated the local post office, had a cocktail lounge, and housed the Coconino Sun newspaper. The hotel opened its doors on New Year's Day, 1927. The community hotel would later be renamed the Monte Vista after holding a contest which was won by a 12-year-old who came up with the name meaning Mountain View. The Monte Vista would be the longest publicly held commercial property in Arizona until it was sold to a private investor in the 1960s. A woman by the name of Mary Costigan moved to Flagstaff from Detroit to help her brother run the Majestic Opera House. She would become the second woman in the world to be granted a radio broadcasting license in 1927. In 1929, she would move KFXY to the Monte Vista Hotel, where more than 400 residents showed up for her maiden broadcast. A system of underground tunnels were built from Northern Arizona University through Flagstaff. The Monte Vista, along with other businesses in the area, had access to these tunnels. Chinese migrant workers who were being harassed around town after being blamed for a devastating fire in the 1900s used these tunnels frequently to avoid being bothered by the locals. The tunnels were home to some suspicious and illegal activity. Evidence of opium dens, old slot machines, and moonshine distilleries have been discovered in the depths of the larger alcoves. 
In 1931, the Monte Vista decided to keep their cocktail lounge open during Prohibition, using the tunnels to transport liquor back and forth, but they would end up getting shut down for their illegal practices. They would serve soft drinks in the meantime until 1933, when Prohibition ended and the cocktail lounge reopened to serve drinks to the masses. These tunnels still exist today, but are mostly used for storage and piping. Today, many of the rooms at the Monte Vista are named after celebrity guests that once frequented the hotel. 203 and 204 are named after Bob Hope. Room 205 is the Michael Stipe Room, 213 is the Bing Crosby Room, 216 is named after Michael J. Fox, and 301 is named after the former mayor of Flagstaff, George Babbitt. Other celebrities who have stayed at the hotel include John Wayne, Freddie Mercury, Anthony Hopkins, and the list goes on. Several of the rooms at the Monte Vista have made headlines as well, but not because of the celebrities who have stayed there. It's for the ghosts who continue to haunt these rooms to this day. John checked in at the front desk and headed up to his room on the second floor. It was late, and he had just finished up a 12-hour workday. He walked down the hallway and stopped at room 210. Fumbling for his room key, he found it and then snicked it into the door lock. As he turned the knob, he felt the sudden sensation of being watched. He turned around and looked back down the hall, but saw nobody. So he opened his door and entered his room. John pulled off his hat, gripping it by its wide brim, and frisbeed it onto the desk chair. It bounced off the arm of the chair and landed on the floor upside down. As he leaned down to pick it up, he froze as he heard something outside his door. It was a muffled voice but he couldn't make out what the voice was saying. John left the hat where it was and approached the door. "'What's that you said there, Pilgrim?' John called through the door. A moment went by, and the voice faintly responded, "'Room service.' "'Room service,' John asked, glancing at his pocket watch, which indicated it was after 11 p.m. He flung the door open, prepared to scold whomever was on the other side, but to his shock, found nobody there. He looked both ways down the hall, and to his utter confusion, still saw nobody. He turned back to the room and suddenly felt a cold sensation on the back of his neck. John whirled around and found himself face to face with a pale-looking bellboy with dark circles around his eyes. John jumped back, startled, and then quickly composed himself, not used to being startled, or at least not used to showing people that he could be startled. Where'd you come from? John asked. The bellboy just smirked and said, you dropped your hat before walking off down the hallway. John turned around and looked at the floor where he had dropped his hat. It wasn't where he had left it. He glanced around the room and spotted the hat sitting neatly on the pillow at the head of the bed on the other side of the room. The next morning, John was up at the crack of dawn, and he headed down to the front desk. Checking out of room 210, he said. Yes, Mr. Wayne, the clerk said. How was your stay? Fine, John responded, adding, That bellhop kid you got work in the night shift, he's a strange one. He tipped his hat and walked out of the lobby. The clerk turned to his co-worker and asked, Was there a bellhop on the night shift last night? Nope. The last bellhop's shift ended at 4 p.m. yesterday. Must have been a ghost. At least one of these hauntings involved John Wayne himself. He was a frequent guest at the hotel when many of the popular westerns were being filmed in the area. John complained multiple times to the front desk that a bellboy was knocking on his hotel room and calling out, Room service. But every time he opened the door, nobody would be there. He eventually realized that he may not have been dealing with a prankster, and this may have been something paranormal. He claimed that he did not feel threatened by the phantom bellboy, and the ghost seemed friendly. John Wayne isn't the only person to hear this knock outside this room, and other guests have even seen the ghostly figure of a bellboy standing outside of room 210. Staff and patrons have witnessed a transparent couple dancing in the cocktail lounge on several occasions. The couple is seen in formal dress, laughing and smiling, eternally dancing. 
disturbing sounds of a crying baby have been heard in the basement over and over again. These reports primarily come from maintenance and laundry personnel. Staff are found running up the stairs to get away from its cries. To those that hear them, the cries are extremely real and disturbing. There have also been reports of a six-foot-tall shadow figure that has been seen by many guests and employees in the basement. They claim that the shadow figure and the crying baby are some of the most disturbing ghosts at the hotel, and it's terrifying because they have no real story for their origin. After a bank robbery in the 1970s, three robbers stopped at the hotel for a drink at the bar, despite the fact that one of the men had been shot by a guard during the robbery, but he decided to join them instead of treating his wounds. He bled out and died while sitting at the bar. Today, guests feel the sensation of being watched at the bar, and bartenders claim that his ghost greets them some mornings. Bar stools will move on their own, and glasses slide around the bar, untouched by human hands. Room 306 In the 1940s, Flagstaff's red light district existed just two blocks from the hotel. One night, a hotel patron invited two sex workers up to his room. He would end up murdering both of them and throwing them out of the window of room 306 to the sidewalk below. Male guests who stay in this room frequently have nightmares of being attacked by two women and being held down. Many of the men who stay here are woken up in terror as they cannot breathe and they feel the sensation of a ghostly hand covering their mouths or being wrapped around their necks. Guests will also report being woken up in the middle of the night, unable to fall back asleep as they feel that they are being watched. Room 220 in the 1980s, a guest who was a butcher staying in room 220 had a strange habit of hanging meat from a chandelier. After being missing for several days, his body was discovered by a housekeeper. People report hearing talking, coughing, and laughter coming from his room when it's vacant. One hotel employee reported exiting room 220 only to notice that all of the lights had turned back on. When he re-entered the room, he realized the TV was on and the volume was on full blast. The once-made bed had its sheets and pillows scattered all over the room. According to another guest, they took a walk around the building, and they were the only ones on the second floor. He smelled the scent of what he described to be sausages or some kind of meat. The odor lingered for about a minute before dissipating. A door to the janitor closet then popped open, and he had to move out of the way to avoid being hit. He began filming and saw a shadow figure cross the corridor. He heard the voice of an old man on the recording who sounded like he was speaking directly into the device. Other guests of room 220 claim that the TV has a mind of its own, and they feel the cold touch of ghostly hands on them as they try to sleep. Room 305, the Bon Jovi Room. People claim that an old woman used to be a long-term tenant, and she would sit in a rocking chair in room 305 for hours on end. She would be staring out the window. It's rumored that she was waiting for her son to return from war. She died in the chair, and it's believed that she haunts this room to this day. People have sensed cold spots in this room. Some have even seen the ghost of the old woman sitting in the chair. They've seen the rocking chair move on its own and creak. The room was even featured on Unsolved Mysteries. Staff and visitors report hearing knocks in the closet, and many have witnessed the rocking chair moving on its own. If you're here, move the rocking chair. I'm Jesse Wilkins, and this is Hometown Ghost Stories, Flagstaff, Arizona. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome into Hometown Ghost Stories, episode 87, I think. I'm Jesse Wilkins. I'm joined by Dave Wilkins. Hello, Dave. Hey, what's going on? That was a crazy video to end that with that rocking chair. It was. That's a terrifying was. video. Yes. Yeah. So that was pulled from 
the travel channel. I can't remember which show it was, but hopefully that doesn't get us DMCA'd. <laughs> but but that was uh yeah, that was a crazy video and they they addressed it as it was real. So that wasn't like a reenactment or anything like that. So um welcome in folks. I'm so glad that we were able to bring you an episode today. When I tell you that we jumped through hurdles to get an episode out today, uh that is an understatement. So to give you a, a quick briefing, we are without Rob today. We'll get to that in a little bit. It's me and Dave. We do have a special guest we're going to bring on in a moment here. But today, uh, Comcast decided to do some, or Xfinity decided to do some work in the area. So they completely killed my internet, to which today is the day that I would produce the video. So I go to Dave's house. Dave wasn't even there. And I produced the whole video at Dave's house. Get it done. Get home like an hour before it airs. Everything is going wrong. Internet was acting terrible until halfway through the stream starting soon video. So anyways, thank you all for sticking with us. It actually went off kind of without a hitch, I think. So hopefully that worked out for you. But what's up to everyone hang out in live chat. We have a ton of people here. We appreciate you all for hanging out. Excited to talk about Flagstaff, Arizona. This place is awesome. The hauntings here are awesome. Um, shout out to Christy and uh, Brendan who joined as new members on YouTube. And I'm interested to hear more from Tom who says that he uh, just stayed at the Monte Vista about two weeks ago. He says, unfortunately, nothing happened, but I'm interested to see if maybe you heard some of the stories that we told here. But without further ado, we do have a special guest here because we do not have Rob. I want to welcome in Brent once again from the Paranormal Portal. What's up, Brent? Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Glad we could be together once again. Thank you for joining us. Another last minute edition, but you uh, made it work. And we appreciate that. And I love your background. You have a hometown ghost stories background. You fit right in. <laughs> well, I got to blend in with the boys. You know what I'm saying? You've love already it. successfully replaced Rob. So for those that don't know already, <laughs> Rob is not here because he is currently playing in day five of the World Series of Poker. And this means he is doing very well. We had kind of alluded to it last week, but we had said, if Rob isn't here, that means it's good news. And the good news is that when you survive five days into the world series of poker that means you're doing pretty well for yourself so rob is officially in the money and we're going to keep our fingers crossed that he continues to um absolutely all smash the money. this tournament yeah that would be nice that would be very nice so we might see some significant upgrades maybe we could actually bring you a stream that works <laughs> if rob wins the world series of poker so we're very excited for rob and uh super pumped with how well he's doing out there it's really exciting i mean this is uh this is the this is the main event of the world series of poker so for those of you who are unfamiliar with how it works there's a bunch of little events that you can play and then the world's the world series the main event is the bit this is the big one so grand prize if he takes it all all the way down is over 12 million dollars there's uh last time i checked there was like around 300 people remaining so uh, that is out of, I believe it was north of 10,000, but I'm not entirely sure. But there was a ton of entries that entered into this thing. And um, he's still alive. But now, like, the blinds are crazy and the stacks are moving and people are getting bumped all over the place. So we'll see how he does. But, Dave, uh, did you curse his chair? No. I Wait, was it you that cursed his chair? It was me that cursed his chair. So I cursed. So way back in the, uh, it was a side content episode. It was the the was it busby chair oh the busby chair yeah yeah and uh we were going of course rob was picking on me as always so i said you know what rob i'm going to put a curse on your gaming chair that you're sitting in right now and the curse is that you're never going to win another hand of poker again so this is how well that curse is going yeah since then he's won so many tournaments that he actually <laughs> won his way into the world series of poker and he's still going so what a curse if you could go ahead and curse my chair next i would yeah do. I'm gonna start. Uh, I'm gonna start selling curses. So hit me up on <laughs> on uh, email, and uh, I will curse whatever you want, and you will seek fortune and fame, and things will just go really well for you. For you, absolutely, that's awesome. And that voice of Dave right now sounds a million times better because Dave has gotten himself a brand new microphone. Mm, so big boy equipment. Sure, SM7B. Nice. That is uh, that is the big one. Sounds absolutely amazing. So, anyways, Brent, thank you so much for coming in so last minute. We do appreciate you being here. Awesome. Yeah. I'm thrilled. I, I have a great time with you guys. And uh, you guys have fast become friends of mine as well. So um, I'm glad to pitch in and help out and uh, help keep the roof up. Absolutely. So thank you so much. I've been enjoying your show. I try to join as many live streams as I can. And your community is awesome. And uh, your show is so well put together. And oh. <laughs> I'm just so how, how often do you go live? I go live Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on YouTube. And then the podcast is released once to once a week on Mondays. 
That so. is impressive. That is impressive. Well, Look how much we did just to get an episode done. Tonight. Yeah, but I don't I don't pre-produce entire videos for every show. So yeah, you, you guys are you guys are doing it right. I, I'm seriously the first time I was here, I really became aware of what you do here, and you guys are are amazing. I mean, you're doing it really, really well. And that's why I'm thrilled to be here with you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah, we do it really well. <laughs> Even if literally 30 <laughs> seconds before the show starts, we're still exporting files. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> if you hadn't said that, nobody would have known. That's true. I know, right? That's true. Yeah. Yep. Anyways. So uh, we're talking about Flagstaff, Arizona today. Two main locations. We're talking about the Weatherford Hotel and the Monte Vista. So the Weatherford, we can start with that one because there isn't too, too much on hauntings inside there, but there is some interesting stuff. And these are both very historic buildings. We're back in another Wild Wild West episode, and it is... This the, both of these locations, it seems like a lot of these stories are are kind of based off legend. So you do have reported deaths at the hotels. Obviously, if these places were around in the early early 1900s, uh, then who knows what could have happened here? You had shootouts. You had, um, it, you know, we, we've talked about this many times before. It's the Wild West, so anything could have happened at these places. But as far as documenting some of these cases that we were reporting on, I found it hard to source a lot of these. A little bit more at the Monte Vista with this one. It was tricky, but the legend has it. You had a couple who were murdered while on their honeymoon. They were staying at the Weatherford Hotel and their bri the bride and groom ghost seemed to had been appearing to people at the foot of their beds. It's a very chilling haunting. And it wasn't just one person that saw this. It was many people that saw this and allegedly so many of them that they actually just stopped using that room as a hotel room and they switched it to uh, storage closet, but that still didn't stop the hauntings. It's kind of an interesting story. The story itself, well, the, the backstory was interesting too, because people, this couple that was murdered, people didn't even realize that they were murdered until like two days after the fact, because they, the hotel staff figured, oh, well, they're just on their honeymoon. We'll leave them alone. We haven't heard from them in a while. And then they went past their check-in or their checkout time. And then finally it was, it had been like 48 hours since anyone had seen them. So finally the hotel staff went to go check on them and they found them dead. And they said, it looked like a murder suicide. It looked like a, um, that she had been killed and that he had then shot himself. Mm -hmm. So, um, pretty creepy stuff. And then the hauntings that follow, of course, also very creepy. Yeah, not exactly how you want your honeymoon to go. So that's a, that's a very creepy <laughs> no, I'd, one. I'd say that's probably less than ideal. <laughs> Agreed. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, and then the fact that the hauntings didn't really stop after that. People still hear, um, they hear their, vo their names being called out. So it's going to be some sort of an intelligent haunting going on here. So people hear their names being called out. They hear noises coming from uh, this former hotel room. And they also, they say if you put your ear up, to it you can actually hear this kind of weird music being played inside so it's tricky when you're at a hotel and we talked about this a lot and obviously we're going to be focusing on hotels today but noise contamination at a hotel especially an active one is so hard to to rule whether or not it's paranormal and you got to be thinking this is like downtown flagstaff that music could be coming from anywhere but if you're only hearing it, it from depends. behind that door yeah depends on the depends on what the music is too right i mean if you hear like creepy old like 1920s music like maybe like it sounds like it's coming from like one of those old school record players. You could say, oh yeah, that must be like a haunting. But if you're hearing like Taylor Swift, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> not like somebody's Spotify podcast. Yeah. Or playlist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, we don't, we don't make the rules. These, these old, go what's wrong? Well, you think old ghosts can't like Taylor Swift, you know? So mm, true. <laughs> I think it's pretty interesting that, you know, I mean, if you think of all of the locations in our modern world and in the, in the past world, that would likely be haunted. Certainly hotels would be up there because um, not everything is tragic. I mean, sometimes people just die in their bed and, and, you know, there's certainly a loss of life, whether natural or otherwise there's, uh, but there are a lot of legends that surround hotels that are kind of hard to wrap your head around. Like the, the jilted bride. It's like every hotel seems to have that, you know, where there's the, the bride that was left at the altar. And and so now she haunts the place after she threw herself out a window or something. And I, and I think there's some of that, but I think it's very interesting that, you know, when you consider the amount of traffic these places have and the amount of people that come and go, it's no wonder that, you know, they leave an imprint, but 
I, I also think if I was going to be earthbound and I had to be stuck somewhere, I think a hotel might be kind of cool because you'd always have people coming to go yeah. and something to watch, you know? Yeah. It's also people. a lot. Of, exactly. It's, it's also a lot of energy to feed off of too. Yeah. And we know that for hauntings to take place and ghosts to manifest or create some sort of paranormal activity, um, they need to feed off energy. When you have new people flowing in and out of these buildings at all times, uh, there's a ample amount of it, especially a hotel that has a reputation of being haunted because then these energy levels are raised because people are afraid to be there or excited to be there to go explore and investigate and try to find themselves some ghosts. So I think all of these things are a recipe for why there are so many haunted hotels in America and around the world. But mm -hmm. especially when you get a place like this and downtown has quite a few haunted places as well. So that's the, uh, the Weatherford hotel. It is an interesting one. Um, it definitely, it, it was falling apart and it served as a whole bunch of different things over the years. I am glad that it did not end up getting demolished because it seemed like it was on the brink of it where they were basically like level this place. It's a dump and we're going to turn it into a parking lot. So then it, it, the new owners, they had done enough to it where they had refurbished it, kind of brought it back to its former glory and they had turned it into a hostel for a little while. They were getting a lot of European travelers and that was kind of popular around that time. And then they managed to land it on the uh, National Historic Registry or whatever. So that prevented, obviously, the building from getting demolished. And now I believe it's still an active hotel. So that's uh, that's cool. Yeah, it's always a plus when they don't demolish the old historic buildings because yeah. you, love, you love to see them. Even if it doesn't stay a hotel, it's nice to see those older buildings preserved. Right. And, a lot of times they turn them into museums and stuff. It's just as long as like we're keeping these old buildings intact because they did build things a lot better back then too. They will, <laughs> they will last a lot longer. Yeah. Oh, uh, well in town here where I live, there's a, there's an old library and it is, it, no, it was the old post office and it's a beautiful old building, but it's, it was decommissioned as the post office and they made the, you know, it was kind of the push in the seventies to move out of these beautiful historically powerful buildings and put in you know little brick squares and call it a building you know which is almost a tragedy but they did preserve the building and it's now it's now like a um a, a brewery slash cafe uh restaurant and it's beautiful in there and it's really neat to be able to still appreciate that um you know i i think those buildings should be preserved not, not that this is the you know the history street channel but you know i think that's powerful that it, it's it's like a, a remnant of our histories and and they should be honored and like like dave said they don't build them like that anymore they just don't um no. i have a lot a, of a lot of them don't even look as good either so like a, no. a lot of these like victorian houses and these old saloons and stuff like that they look so cool and then you get some modern piece of crap that's just a big rectangle you're like well you yeah know, knock <laughs> that one down and build something else so it seems to be a lost art is the way that these uh these buildings and restaurants and hotels used to look well but, they used to build the frames with solid oak like do you know how much mm -hmm. that would cost nowadays <laughs> to build a house out of solid oak well Too you much. know I, I just uh, was on an investigation at the the montvale hotel in spokane washington it's the old they consider it the oldest uh surviving building that's a that's a hotel and it, it's kind of funny because that 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 theme plays out through so many of these buildings these old buildings that they may have been built as a hotel but it may have been a hospital or it may have been uh you know a brothel or a speakeasy or any number of things through the years and so you know not only just being a hotel but all the other things that happen in these buildings is just like supercharged you know um but they all seem to have many incarnations through their existence and uh I'm sure all of that stuff leaves a pretty significant imprint. For sure. I mean, you see it with, with both of these buildings. I mean, more so with the Monte Vista, but I mean, the Monte Vista seemed to have everything. It had the post office. It had a radio station. It had a theater. It had all sorts of, you know, obviously had the saloon speakeasy mm -hmm. um, during Prohibition. They were, you know, that's when they were obviously a speakeasy. So it, it has all these different things. Then you have the underground tunnels, which have it has its own history. There's just so much tied to these places it's it's pretty awesome i want to give a shout out to matthew thomas throwing two dollars in super chat he says acknowledge me hometown ghost stories matt <laughs> we always acknowledge you you're an Matthew. absolute legend here and i also wanted to say welcome in to uh what was her name or his name i forget anyways uh shout out to uh, shout out to everyone who's here that is uh is brand new i actually saw a few people come in and leave a comment saying that this is their first time here experiencing a live stream and i'm just still 
shocked and happy that we were actually able to bring you a live stream today. <laughs> but we've carried on enough about that. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much the Weatherford Hotel. And like we said, there, there's plenty of reasons for a place like this to be haunted. And we're just happy that this building is still standing. Do they add it to the list? I'm going to go there. Do you guys know? Do they like, uh, do they allow investigations or as far, uh, as, far as I know, the Weatherford is. Uh, not as open to it as the Monte Vista. So obviously if you book oh. a room there, you can do it. But I was uh, looking at or watching a few videos on it or listening to a few podcasts about it. And it sounds like the weather for it doesn't really want anything to do with it. The Monte Vista fully embraces it. In fact, a lot of the ghost stories and facts that I got about hauntings from the Monte Vista was directly from their website. So they, wow. they post about it. They, they seem to embrace it, which obviously we all appreciate over here. Love that. Love when you do that. I mean, why not? right? It's a historic location. Why not uh, lean into the ghost stories that have happened there? So then um, there's been some some shocking stuff. So for audio listeners, I, I, I will go back and address that video that we played at the end. We briefly talked about it. It was a terrifying video, if real. And it was presented as real on the Travel Channel. And so I, I wouldn't discredit anything. Upon watching the video, I was like, that was way too crazy to be real, right? You saw that basically I'll, I'll describe what happened, which was it's this video. It's his family at it, it, there. They used a Ouija board first and then they they tried to um, they're trying to get the ghost to do something. They're like, if you're here, move the chair. If you're here, can you move the chair? And then you saw this chair move directly at them. Everyone screams and they run out of the room and the terror seemed legitimate. So it seemed like the fear was real. The only question I would have was, was this dad pulling a prank on the kids or was this the mom pulling the prank on the kids and then making a cool video. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and the fact that it made it to the travel channel and, and all that and was presented as legitimate um, evidence. Of that's course, one I'll variable that's important when you're talking about these videos and you're trying to determine if they're real or, or if they're fake, because there are so many of them that look so good that are all so fake, but they're well done. But mm -hmm. you could always tell or not always, but you can almost always tell when the acting is really bad or when mm -hmm. they're not acting as scared as they should be if the thing that they're showing was actually happening. Right. So this one did seem, you, you did hear it in the audio. You could probably tell that it did sound legitimate, but uh, yeah. The fear, the fear was real. So from the skeptical side, I mean, when I first saw it, I was like, that's awesome. And I watched it again. I'm like, mm, probably fake, but still awesome. Good enough yeah. to, you know, make it in the video. So at least we can discuss it. The only sure. thing that I would say that, that makes me think that maybe it wasn't real is the way that the chair moved. So obviously the chair moving is, is pretty concerning, you know, in itself, but the way that it, it moved, if you look at the video is it kind of moves forward, but also rotates. And to me, that seems like somebody might've had a fishing line tied to one of the legs. And when you have it tied to one of the legs that would cause that movement where it, it rotates and moves forward. So that was kind of my first instinct was like, yeah, I mean, it was pulling from one side clearly and then moving forward. So still a cool video. You guys can let us know what you think in the comments below if our entire video doesn't get pulled for using that video. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, other, and, uh, the other red flag to me is uh, when watching videos like that is when when people are saying, oh, all this haunting stuff is happening, but it always happens towards them. So in other words, like the chair turned towards the person with the camera. You know, right. And I've seen many other videos where it's like, oh, look at that phone cord. It's wiggling, and but it's towards the person. Then it's a towel pulling off of the counter towards. And so, it, you know, that's that is a red flag to me. But I'm also the guy that's seen a chandelier pull out of a ceiling in real time. So, you know, that's a true story. Um, you know, Wait, seen, you, can't, you can't just you can't just preview that story and not actually tell us the story. <laughs> oh, God, I'm so, I've, Please I've give us the details. It. OK, so I used to live in this this. Uh, uh, I owned this Victorian home back in uh, Minnesota and uh, it's a story I've told many times. So if my listeners are here, I'm sorry, because I'm going to tell it again, but um, this, this house had activity, but it wasn't constant. It was just every once in a while. And uh, it was, it was, there was many things that happened in this house doors, you know, flopping. I had this old uh, kitchen door that would go back and forth, you know, like the, they do. And uh, it would do it on its own uh, sometimes, but, I had just, well, it's a little editorial, so forgive me, but it was just after I separated from my, my first wife 
and I was all alone. She took the dining room set. She took a lot of stuff, which is kind of another story altogether. <laughs> but I'll be fine. Um, but I was I was leaving the house one day. I was all alone. Didn't have any pets, any cats, anything. And I was leaving the house, and I walked through the the kitchen door, through the dining room because there's no dining room table or chairs anymore. And then I was walking to the door about to leave. I put my hand on the on the door handle to open it to the porch and then out. But I had a feeling I had to turn around. So as soon as I turned around, there's an old chandelier in that ceiling. And at that very moment, when I turned around, it boom, came out of the ceiling, plaster came out of the ceiling, and I'm talking screws, Holy and, and it hit my floor. And, and <laughs> honest to God, there's something wrong with me. I readily admit it. But the only thing I thought was, oh, damn it. Now I got to fix that. You know, I was absolutely. <laughs> you already lost the dining room table yeah. and everything. Now you got to get a new chandelier. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was, yeah. yeah, I was just like at the end of my rope anyway. But it was like, oh, now I got to fix that. So, um, true story though. Truly, that's happened. wild. That's wild. Yeah. Speaking of wild stories, we're going to attempt to do this, and if it doesn't work out, we apologize. But we might have a live update from the one and only Rob Coakley. Hello, Rob. What's up, Paris? Can you hear me? Sure you can. can. Excellent. Yes, I am on dinner break. I wanted to pop in and say hello to everybody. Thank everybody for the support. Um, we're still in it. There's less than 225 people left. Woo. And we have uh, locked up $58,000 right now. Oh Woo. my God. So Which we is are entirely going to come to promote hometown ghost stories. So we yes. appreciate that. Ta tax write off. When you guys see a lot of YouTube ads for Hong Kong Go Stories, <laughs> it was clearly, it was all World Series of Poker money that Rob has uh, provided. That's all I did this for, to be perfectly honest. So. Well, good luck, Rob. We're glad you were able to swing by. Uh, this connection actually worked out pretty nicely. We see beautiful Las Vegas behind you. Uh, what's it going to take to get you over to uh, Zach, Bag Zach Baggins Honda Museum? Um, well, once I bust out of this tournament, I'm going to sit it. in my room and cry for 36 hours. And, <laughs> and then maybe after that, we'll go over there. We'll see uh, see where the day takes me. Yeah, if we can get a live crying stream from Zach Baggins Haunted Museum, I think that would be worth it. <laughs> it is probably best that you don't go over there and risk uncursing the curse that I put on you. I think you, yeah, you, need, that. This. you need that curse to thrive. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Rob. We'll let you go. Good luck. All right. Question up. Thanks, guys. Peace. That is our field reporter, Rob Coakley, <laughs> tuning in from Las Vegas from the World Series of Poker. So that is a, that's a fun update. So anyways, back to the show. So let's talk about the Monte Vista because this mm. one is full of ghost stories. It's full of hauntings. And there was a few that I didn't even mention on the show. So I think we start with those and then we'll kind of jump into some of the more terrifying, um, the more terrifying ones. So yeah. There is one, I thought it was going to be on this website, but they didn't list it on this website, but I, I did hear about it in a few podcasts and a few other ones. So there's not only a phantom bellboy, but there's also supposed to be a ghost that haunts the elevator. And it's like a former elevator attendant. And this has been reported on by a lot of people. So the way it goes is people get into the elevator. They don't see anyone with them. And then a lot of times when leaving the elevator, they will see in the reflection that there was somebody else standing there. And he's dressed as like an elevator attendant from like the early 1900s. And it's kind of a terrifying one. It's one where you see it in the reflection, but not in person. And this is actually the second week in a row we're talking about this. We had one yeah. last week on a listener submitted ghost story where they were in a hotel as well. This one was in New Mexico, I believe. And they would they saw a shadow figure moving around the bed, but they only saw him in the mirror it was in the shape of a man and he was walking around the beds and i don't know if you listen to that episode or not brent but basically this couple they had gone out and they had looked at a bunch of homes in new mexico because they were looking to buy a house and then they got back to the hotel and they saw this haunting so they're not sure if this was a haunted hotel or if something had followed them back to their hotel from one of the houses that they visited and they had hit like 20 houses so they wouldn't even know which one it was but this was a haunting where they only saw it in the mirror and not in person. And this elevator haunting seems to be relatively similar where they're only seeing the reflection in the, I don't know if it's the mirror in the elevator or off one of the like metal um, walls or, or whatever, but 
it's, a, it's an interesting haunting. And this is our second week in a row covering one like this. Have you heard of a, a haunting like this where you only see it in mm -hmm. like its reflection? I, you know, I, I, through the years, I've heard of a lot of people having experiences like that. And, and there does seem to be, uh, well, there is a mystical history of the mirror. It was, uh, very much considered to be like a sacred object and used for scrying and, and, uh, they were extraordinarily expensive when they used to be made. That's where some people attribute the whole bad luck thing to. Cause if, if you did break one, it would take you about seven years to buy a new one. But um, yeah, I mean, there does seem to be the, well, I know the, uh, there's a lot of people that would, that entertain the idea that mirrors are portals um, or can be portals or are mystical properties in any regard. Um, you, you wonder if if it is indeed almost a dimensional thing in those cases like it's it's kind of not really in your dimension but it's it's aware of you and i don't know it's it seems like just such a mind game you know um, absolutely i had asked about this last week because i was like what is the deal with mirrors and why are they considered to be so haunted and we had a couple of good answers in chat and i found them interesting so i actually looked into it between then and now and the apparently it was the ancient Romans that believed that mirrors or any reflective surface were a reflection of the human soul mm -hmm. and they must not be misused or something terrible could happen and the soul could be lost. And then there's many cultures around the world that feel that mirrors are portals to the other worlds, predictors of the future and windows into the afterlife. afterlife. So, and additionally, uh, there's several cultures and uh, Slavic cultures, especially, that uh, have a, a, a ritual of. When someone dies, they, you cover all the mirrors in your home because you don't want their soul to wander into the mirror realm and get stuck. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the, you know, I mean, it's these ancient, uh, I don't know, if, I, I think they're wisdoms, but they're at least ancient ideals. But there's, there's something to it. You know, mis there is something really mysterious about mirrors. And uh, that, that, it, that is interesting that you mentioned that too, the whole covering of the mirrors. We discussed that kind of at length in the Velisca axe murder episode that we did, uh, okay. which was one of the MOs of that killer was every time he would kill a family. If you believe that the, the murderer from the Velisca axe murders was the man from the train, which we had talked about where his MO was, he would always cover all of the windows as well as all the mirrors in the house with, with sheets. And you can understand the windows if it's a murderer, right? And the window, maybe he's just trying to block out the crime scene so people can't see in. Sure. But why would he go around and cover the mirrors as well? So it's believed that he did believe in that and he was superstitious. And mm -hmm. um, or he or maybe he was trying to block out the crime scene and just didn't want to look at himself because he felt shame. But sure, there's that too. I think it's I That's think it's what I had figured I'd figured it was a he didn't want a situation where he didn't want to watch himself doing what he's doing because despite the fact that he wanted to do it. Uh, he knew it was shameful. And I think that that's probably what that was. Possibly. Could there's have been. An, there's another old belief with mirrors, and I don't know how, how valid it is, but I remember hearing about it years and years ago that if you ever want to know the state of somebody's soul, when they're sleeping, come up behind them and hold a mirror in front of them and look at their reflection because the reflection will show you the state of their soul. So... That also sounds like a really creepy thing to get caught doing. <laughs> oh, creepy. sorry. Oh, yeah. nothing. <laughs> you wake up and you're looking at yourself and you stroke out. Yeah. <laughs> so that is the uh, the elevator haunting. There, there's been, you know, people report feeling that somebody is watching them. They feel like they're not alone in the elevator. All those kinds of um, all those kinds of stories. But the reflection thing I did find interesting, especially in lieu of what happened last week. Um with with that story as well so uh kind of moving down the line well i think we go from like um least scary to most scary or most compelling so you have the dancing couple i briefly touched on this this has been seen a few times in the um in the cocktail lounge they just see the ghostly couple and they're very formally dressed and they're just dancing with each other and they're smiling and they seem to be having a good time the they're seem yeah laughing together and dancing around the cocktail lounge and then they vanish so they're eternally dancing. So it seems like sort of a, an imprint, you know, it seems like it's yeah. residual haunting, Yeah. but kind of a happy story, you know, unless they hate dancing and this is their hell. <laughs> they're just stuck doing this forever. But <laughs> the fact that they're laughing and smiling makes me think that this is a, uh, you know, kind of a, kind of a nice haunting. So mm. one that I found creepy and one that ended up at least John Wayne didn't think it was a threatening haunting is the phantom bellboy. So mm -hmm. with this one, we had talked it at length. Dave did a, a ghost story on it. And then uh, we 
we talked about it as well, which is basically people will get a knock on their door. It's room 210 and it'll say room service. But when people go to check who is there because they didn't order room service, nobody's there. Or they did order room service and they're like, where the hell did he go? Where's my room service? But either way, there's nobody there. And the hauntings don't stop there. It's not just people hearing this and, and communicating with this ghost. Other people that are walking down the hallway do see the ghost of somebody dressed as a bellboy standing at the door. And he's not always like knocking at the door or talking to people inside. Sometimes his ghost is just standing there staring at the door, which is actually really creepy. <laughs> but according to John Wayne and some other people that have experienced this haunting, they say that it's a friendly ghost and they don't feel threatened by it. So, hmm. but still obviously, really John, obviously John Wayne didn't feel threatened by it. He's John Wayne brave. doesn't feel threatened by anyone. <laughs> That's right. I feel threatened by your John Wayne accent, though. So. Ch chat wasn't convinced by my John Wayne accent, my John Wayne impression. <laughs> oh, it was a good shot. I, I do some pretty good accents. John Wayne, not one of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So he experienced that. And then housekeepers experience uh, the antics of the bellboy. One report states seeing a young male in an old fashioned red coat with brass buttons walking up and down the halls. So I guess he's not always just standing in front of the door. He also walks up and down the halls. Either way, it's, it seems like a very active haunting and, and, and people seem to experience it over and over again. It's not just guests who stay in 210. It's also uh, hotel staff as well. Um, then you have some of the more threatening ones. Uh, I guess we could touch on um, room 220 as well. So this was the guy who was a butcher and was hanging meat from the chandelier. I'm Ooh. telling you, if, if there's a way to get kicked out of a hotel, that's going to be one of them, right? <laughs> Apparently not. They let him do it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is Arizona. Apparently, it's not like the hottest um, town. Or I think it's actually a city. I don't think it's the hottest city in Arizona. Uh, we were in the Patreon pre-show hangout, and we were talking with, I believe it was Rachel. Was it Rachel who said that she was no, out there? It was cold. Allison. Allison was yeah. So Allison was there, and she said it was cold, um, and she was in there in like June. So wow. either way, this is Arizona. This is a hotel. It's not a refrigerator, <laughs> and they're they're hanging meats. I don't know. Yeah, it's so there were people were complaining about the smell. They're like, there's the smell of rancid meat coming from this room. What is this? And then they they didn't like check on the guy until again, nobody saw the person for, for a while. And then they eventually went in and they found all this like meat just hanging from the chandelier, <laughs> which is like, what what are you doing? <laughs> they also found him dead, which is kind of an yeah. important detail. Yeah. So uh the so he was found dead in the hotel and now he is supposed to haunt the hotel. And there's a lot of, there's actually, this is one of the more active rooms in the hotel. So they get, you know, noises, knocks and voices coming from it. Uh, but you had one, one maintenance guy who went in there and he was working on repairs and um, he needed to go get some stuff. So he left and he turned off the lights and he locked the door. He came back a few minutes later and all the lights were back on. The television was on at full blast and all of the bedding had been like torn, you know, the, basically the room was completely, Shred. everything was, was thrown about and it was, it was a giant mess. And that was, uh, that was his experience. So like the, it's, it's pretty crazy. Cause like you have electronic malfunctions that happens all the time in hauntings, but for something to rip all the bedding off in the pillows and throw everything around the room, you're dealing with poltergeist activity or something worse. So it is actually kind of terrifying what could be going on in this room. So, um, more Other or guess. less terrifying than what was going on in the room before the guy died. <laughs> <laughs> At least you can sort of explain that. Strange, but explainable, right? Uh, I don't know, know. When, when ghosts are doing it, that's that's pretty concerning. But that's not the only haunting that's happened there. Other people say that the TV kind of acts on its own accord and it'll it'll go all crazy. Uh, we've heard of that before happening in hotels as well. And then um, they also say that they get guess while they're sleeping, they'll feel like a like cold hands touch them in the middle of the night which is very concerning, especially yeah. if you're alone. And that's that's not definitely not like an imprint and like a residual kind of thing because it's interacting directly with the people there, you know, or the things that are there, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's messing uh, with the equipment in the room. It's moving stuff around, and it's apparently touching people too. So pretty scary stuff. And then similar to that one with the cold hands, and this makes me wonder if it's not – ghosts that are reserved to one room but maybe moving around in room 306 this was the room where allegedly two sex workers were murdered and then thrown out the window which is particularly brutal they were murdered before being thrown out the window but their bodies just boom onto the sidewalk below makes me wonder if someone got caught i could not find 
any news reports tied to any of these things, mm-hmm. um, even the bank robbery in like 1970, you'd think there'd be a, a, a news report tied there. So again, we're dealing with p- potentially legends, but you know, I, I give them the benefit of the doubt, and a lot of this information is coming directly from the hotel website. So is it this the latest room 306 has happened in the 70s? No, no, that was the uh, bank robbery that happened in the 70s. Okay. This one was the early 1940s. Okay, mm-hmm. gotcha. So they were killed by uh, apparently they were killed by a guy who you know picked them up and brought them back to the room. And then they threw them out. But the hauntings are pretty terrifying with this one. And it's not the murderer that's haunting the room. It is the women who are haunting the room. And they sound um, like they're pretty upset, which is understandable. But it's men who stay, him, you know? Yep. Yeah. So so men stay in the room and they experience uh, the sensation of somebody putting their hand over their mouth so they can't breathe. And that's how they wake up. Or they also feel the sensation of being choked by cold, ghostly hands pretty terrifying stuff they'll also have nightmares so they have these nightmares in this room about two women attacking them and they say they wake up and they feel like they're just being watched and they can't fall back asleep so it's specifically targets men but i believe that women have experienced hauntings in here as well and it seems like something evil is lurking in this room it's uh pretty concerning people are quick to dismiss this backstory as legend because of the fact that there's no documentation on it and i have a hard time siding with them on that one a lot of times it's like, all right, if there's no documentation, you kind of have to wonder. But this is a situation where two sex workers were murdered in yeah. the 1940s. And I back then, whereas you you deal with sex workers now being murdered and the murders not being taken seriously by law enforcement. And back then, especially if it was somebody prominent or somebody um, higher up, this could have more likely it would have been covered up and swept under the rug and not reported than actually reported, which then would make sense as to not being able to find any documentation on it whatsoever. So I think it's more likely that you wouldn't be able to find documentation on something like this. And I don't think dismissing it as legend for that fact is, uh, is necessarily warranted. No, I completely agree with you there. So especially the further back you get, the the harder it's going to be to find stuff on this. Uh, Donnie asks if the sex workers were strangled. I believe they were, I believe that's how the story goes. So mm-hmm. that's um, might be why, you know, as almost a revenge thing. That's why men are being strangled in that room. So it's a uh, concerning one. It's a tragic story and it's a scary haunting. It really is. So we have that. And then uh, we can go next door or across the hall to room 305. This was kind of the main story that we focused on. And we, we already talked about the chair moving and what we thought of that video. But this was the story apparently does have some documentation. According to hotel employees, they say that there is evidence that there was a long term tenant who stayed in this room. It was an older woman. She did sit in this rocking chair all the time. It was facing the window. They believe that she was waiting for her son to come back from war or something along those lines. But apparently there is some sort of paperwork that says that uh, that this was most likely true. So uh, this is uh, of the stories that we mentioned. This one is um, most rooted in fact. So Mm. now you have hauntings tied to this rocking chair. People see it moving. Again, we we showed the video there, but people see it rocking and they also hear it rocking, which is um, a little bit uh, more concerning. My my father actually brought it up in chat a few months ago. He's like, when you hear a rocking chair, like a a rocking chair will not creak unless somebody is sitting in it. Mm. And so if you see a rocking chair move, maybe the wind can blow it, but you're not going to hear it creak unless it's supporting some sort of weight. So... That was a uh, kind of a good point. Uh, we have Rob is back. So we're going to bring in Rob here and we'll see how it goes. I don't know if he's just hanging out, but it looks very, uh, very beautiful in this pose. So let's bring back Rob. What's up, Rob? What that for? I just came back to say that I'm going to crush Dave to death with a rocking chair. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was the... Uh, Another breaking news update from Rob in Las Vegas. <laughs> Couldn't go the whole show without threatening to kill Dave. At least Chat has time. been uh, re- requesting ad nauseum the entire time that Rob come in just to threaten my life because there aren't enough violent undertones, apparently, as we talk about murdering prostitutes and throwing them out hotel windows. <laughs> so not violent enough for this chat. <laughs> Brent, you're doing a great job, but next time you come here, if you could just threaten Dave a little bit more, it would, it would really make us feel more at home. Yeah, I got to work on this. Yeah. All right. Very Sorry. good. <laughs> a little green still. I'll figure it out. 
so this is so, so this is room 305 uh we talked about the rocking chair moving also people see this ghost sitting in this rocking chair uh near the window they see them from outside they see her from inside the hotel room it is a creepy haunting we we talked about this also last week with the old the olds the old people ghosts <laughs> something very <laughs> creepy about this but um yeah that's so that's that's what we have with 305 it's also called the bon jovi room i believe no. Do it. Is there any knowledge that did her son die and that's why he never came or did anybody know? I'm not too sure. I'm not okay. too sure. That was just kind of what they alluded to. It seems like they're guessing about whether or not she was actually waiting for someone. They had kind of assumed it was her son. And I feel like him coming back from war is a, a story that fits for why she would be waiting for so long. But sure. I'm not entirely sure which year she was there. I'm and just not sure. Obviously. Couldn't... If he couldn't make it or if he was just a bad son. <laughs> Can't rule that out. <laughs> so that's possible. <laughs> Dark um, as that is. Yeah, I would I would love to know what years that mm. she was staying in this hotel. Because apparently she was a long term tenant. She was there for a while. But you know, obviously if it's in the forties, you'd be like, Oh, he was away at World War Two. Or, you know, if you know, if you could match it up to some sort of war, then you could kind of figure that out. But I think the more important thing is did she exist? It seems like the answer is yes. Did she stay at the hotel? The answer is yes. Was she always sitting in that rocking chair? It seems like the answer is yes. So that's plenty of reason for her to be haunting the room. And they say like, you're not supposed to touch this chair. You're not supposed to sit in this chair without asking permission, which is something that we've seen in a few places. We just dealt with that at the Shamley hotel where we were in the mobster's room. That was a thing it was like, you can sit in this chair, but only if you ask the ghost for permission and only if it grants you permission via spirit box or some sort of communication. And it gave Dave permission. It gave Rob permission. This thing refused to let me sit in the chair. So <laughs> that was kind of a kind of a cool scenario. Good judge of character. Yeah. So <laughs> the Monte Vista is on my list of places I want to go. But if I, go to room if I go to room 305, I do not have faith that I will receive permission to sit in said chair. Mm. So that is uh, that's that one. So then you have the, the bank robbery. Um, this one in the 1970s, we talked about it. They robbed the bank, three guys. One of them got shot by a guard during the bank robbery. And instead of going to go treat his wounds, they decided to go grab a drink, which <laughs> this sounds like my kind of crowd. I'm like, ah, dude, it could wait. You'll be fine. But it couldn't. And they were wrong. And he bled out at the bar and died, allegedly. Um, before and for, there, for there to be no documentation on this one in the 1970s, that one for me is a little bit harder to uh, wrap my head around. Yeah. I didn't dig too far trying to find this one, but you would think that this this story should be everywhere. It's a bank robbery and one of the guys died. So yeah. also it was supposed to be like a bank nearby. Like, what are you doing? You rob a bank and then you just go like, like let's go to the bar right across the street. Yeah, a little far-fetched. <laughs> we'll celebrate. Uh, it's, yeah, it sounds like a crazy story, but apparently this is another friendly haunting. So I should have mentioned this one earlier, but this one is like the bartenders say that they're greeted by this ghost in the morning. Sometimes it just says, yeah, good morning. <laughs> they're oh. like hey good morning ghost so <laughs> seems like a friendly haunt might be an intelligent haunt but he also moves bar stools bar stools around it'll slide drinks you know uh, around the bar so stuff like that is is the haunting it seems like it's a little bit of a mischievous ghost but i don't know don't how much I, yeah i don't know how much i buy this origin story but maybe it is legit maybe we can find documentation on it again the hotel embraces it so they they believe this story it's on their website but bars um, seem to be hot spots too. I mean, you know, as far as hot spots go for for uh, paranormal activity, bars are right up there too. Yeah, for oh, the absolutely. same same reasons as a hotel would be. Right? Sure. All the energy, all the yeah. people passing through over the years. Absolutely. It's not that far fetched that people could die at bars as well. It's <laughs> bar fights, people getting shot. You there's know? a there's a bar like right across the street from. Um, from our restaurant in Boston and I'm pretty sure one person dies there a month. Like, it's just oh, like God. so yeah, pretty dangerous stuff. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that deaths well, can happen. Well, even if people aren't dying at the bar, if you're like, if you get a guy who, or, or girl who frequents the bar all the time, they're in there all the time, they're regular. And then they pass away somewhere else. Their spirit could still haunt that location. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, think of all the drunk driving accidents that happen leaving there mm -hmm. too. So, Oh yeah. Good can point. definitely happen. Can definitely happen. So the basement of this place is apparently the most terrifying. And as you know, we just talked about hometown origin stories. We don't have any origins for any of these hauntings, but they are um, widely regarded as the most horrifying hauntings in this place. So 
The first one is you have like the six foot tall shadow figure that people mm -hmm. have seen. And it's mostly seen by like employees. And you always kind of take the, we, we talk about in haunted hotels, it's like guests, they might be expecting it. They might be coming up with it. They might just be trying to clout chase or whatever. But when it comes from the employees of the hotel, that's where I, I, I put a little bit more credit in those stories, not to yeah. discount anyone's story, but it's always like, you know, they're, they're the ones that are at this place every day, every night. These people are putting in the hours. They're more like if they have a haunting, or if they have a, a, a story about a haunting, then to me, it's like, okay, well, let's, let's hear this one first. Anyways, just my personal opinion on it. But uh, so staff, they, they report seeing this, this shadow figure in the basement. They don't know where it came from, but apparently it's, it's pretty terrifying. And the scarier haunting in this basement that is reported on, and I'm sure chat would agree with us, is they, they hear the sound of a baby crying. And they say it sounds so real. And there would be no reason for a baby to be down here. But multiple staff hear this. And they, they say that all the time. Mm -hmm. They have employees who are literally running up the stairs because they're just trying to get away from this baby that is just crying. And it sounds so real. And they go down. Obviously, they look around and they don't find a baby. But this is an ongoing haunting. And it says it, it sounds like the baby is almost on like a loop. Like the crying is just on a loop where it just keeps repeating itself, repeating itself, repeating itself. It's pretty terrifying. Yeah, reminds me have, of... Good. Reminds you of what? Oh, I was going to say, do, do you remember um, way back in the day, we, we used to play the Max Payne games? Oh, my God. And there, the there was dream this, level. Oh. this dream level. I don't, <laughs> Brent, if you're, I don't know if you game at oh. all. Do you ever play the Max Payne oh, games? Oh, yeah, no? I game, but I, I'd never played those, no. Oh, okay, this was like back in, I think it was PlayStation 2. I, I think yeah, that's it was like 2001, you, 2002. But there's just this this level. It was really hard to beat. And the whole time, there's just this loop of a baby crying. And it was like really creepy. But like, of course, it just drives you absolutely insane because you're stuck on it for hours. But yeah, um, <laughs> Swanee says that was that was Max Payne too. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, so it was Max Payne glad, too. Glad somebody knew what we were talking about here. But apparently that's what they hear down, down there. And I've heard a few skeptics on this. They say like, search this basement for some sort of like a Bluetooth speaker. And I get, mm -hmm. and, and, and they think it's like the staff is just messing with people, but why would the staff mess with the staff? I mean, I, I guess you could, I hate that form of skepticism. It's so lazy. It's like, it's I don't, lazy. it's like, I don't understand this. So it must be this. It's like, yeah, okay, I hate, there's, yeah. there's no evidence for that either. No one's ever right. found a Bluetooth speaker. When there's they more say evidence that there's a ghost down there playing Max Payne too. <laughs> <laughs> that could be it too. It's just someone just trying to beat that level all the time. They, we know that struggle. No, I, I agree with you, Dave. It's like, like if your position on that is find me the Bluetooth, no, you find the Bluetooth right. and then we'll be like, all right, well, yeah. let's see, you know, maybe, maybe you are debunking it. So, um, yeah, you're, you're right. That's super lazy in my opinion, but that's, a, if, that's just a terrifying haunting. If I do end up dying from Rob Coakley, most likely murdering me, my ghost is probably going to be stuck on an infinite loop of me trying to beat that level on Max Payne. <laughs> I know that that's going to be my, that's going to be my limbo. It's your darkest, darkest <laughs> moment in life. <laughs> so those are kind of the hauntings at the Monte Vista and the uh, Weatherford Hotel. Super cool. Uh, I'm, as far as I know, both of these places are still open, so you can go visit it. I know a few people in chat had, um, has visit, they've at least visited the Monte Vista before. So, so what, a, what, a, what a cool place. What a cool place. Arizona's awesome. I've been there before. And, you know uh, that, bell boy, that bell boy uh, story? reminded me of one that i uh, that i'd heard um it's not the same story this one had to do with one of the baldwins and i don't remember one of the baldwin brothers um not alec but uh it, one of his brothers and and they were shooting a movie apparently and it might have been in the same location i don't know but uh, they were staying at an old hotel and he said he, he got back from shooting late and i'm going to be paraphrasing this so i might be butchering the hell out of it but they got in late from shooting uh, oh, no, it was when he checked in. He, he checked in, he had his bags and stuff, and he, he got in the elevator, and there was this old guy in the elevator. Said, what floor, sir? And he told him he had his key card and stuff or his room key or whatever and said, what floor? And so the the elevator guy, bell bellboy, elderly bellboy, brought him up, and he said he grabbed his luggage, and they walked down to the room, and, and uh, the Baldwin guy opened the door, and the old fella put the, the bags in the door. And he said, he, he said, oh, thank you. And he said he turned around quick and put his hand in his pocket to pull out some cash to tip him. 
And in, 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 in just a few seconds, it took him to pull the money and turn back around. There was nobody there. He leans out in the hallway and he said he was right in the middle of this. They were the only ones staying on this floor. He, he insisted on being on his own floor. He said there, it was a long hallway either way. And he looked out up and down both ways and there was nobody there. Well, the next, the next morning he went down to the desk. He's like, yeah, you know, who's the elderly uh, bellboy? Uh, he really did a great job and I wanted to tip him, but he disappeared. And they said, we don't have any bellboys. <laughs> That's very similar. And right. it, what's crazy about that, and if this is a ghost, this thing carried his luggage. Right. <laughs> that, yeah. is, that is nuts. However, it is a Baldwin. And if I see a Baldwin reaching into a pocket, I'm also <laughs> running like hell. Like, no, no, no. Don't trust this man. You have to get shot. I think you're so. more at risk if you have a camera, though. <laughs> <laughs> Too Very soon? True. No. Yeah, tragic. Tragic. <laughs> yeah, it was Billy so. Baldwin at the Tempest Bledsoe Hotel. There you go. Thank you, oh. sir quick on that jeez you're like uh what, what's what's joe rogan's assistant's name <laughs> so shit can't think of it well, I I don't don't know. Know. he's always yeah. quick on the google though yeah he is anyways uh that's pretty much it for for flagstaff i mean there are other haunted locations here so i'll kind of leave those on the table in case we do go back but um what are you guys yeah. thoughts here what do you think I think it's pretty good. I mean, I like, I always like the, uh, the haunted hotels. I've done, uh, I've covered so many haunted hotels, in my, in my two years here at hometown ghost stories. But, um, this is, this is some good ones. I like when we get the unique stories and you get a meat that ha a ghost that hangs meat from his chandeliers. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, pretty unique. Yeah. I, I think it's incredible. And, you know, and it's funny, these, these old towns and these towns are old and they saw so much brutality through so many generations uh, as, as the America we know was being carved out of the, out of the, the ground um, and, and just horrible things happened uh, tombstone flagstaff. I, I think those old Western towns are just hot spots for tragedy and, and imprints and, and that, that negative energy. And so I, I, I find it fascinating. I did not know the history of flagstaff as such, but I I've learned about it tonight and, and I'm, I'm fascinated, and the parallels between this and the hauntings at Tombstone, I think, are pretty, pretty incredible. Yeah, there were some connections there too. So mm -hmm. you had um, with the Weatherford Hotel. Weatherford was, I mean, he was bouncing back and forth from Tombstone to Mexico. And that's kind of where he oh. earned a lot of his money. So it's always fun to mention that. That was all the way back episode two, episode two mm -hmm. of Hometown Ghost Stories. We covered right. Tombstone, Arizona. So that was uh, in our. Our wee infancy. moments, our infancy, yes, <laughs> or when we just sat in the basement and cried. That's pretty much, uh, pretty much how that went. So if you're if you're wondering how the audio sounds on episode two, I don't believe we've redone that one, so it actually does sound like a baby crying in a basement. So uh, wait until we fix that one before you go back and listen. But it's a classic, you know. What can you do? Anyways, uh, Brent, what you get? What do you got coming up on your on your shows? Tell us, uh, tell us about what you got going on. Um, I tell you what, I, I I've been doing. On, on Saturday nights on my show, I've been doing live investigation right here in the studio. And this house has activity anyway that I'm in uh, where I live and have the studio. And so I've, I've started setting up equipment and just doing stuff live on the shows. And surprisingly, I've caught some pretty cool stuff live on the air as it's happening. And yeah, I was, I was tuned into one of your streams and you have like some sort of a a meter what is it what is the software you have going on live on the show oh, like literally that, on the screen the ghost radar yeah yeah it's x paranormal detector it's an old old program i got it when they were first starting to make these programs uh, i went out and downloaded it and have had it for years but but it it's it, it, it allegedly uh, and and some people oh yeah whatever those softwares are garbage but the thing is is that we believe spirits uh, either uh, have um, uh, electromagnetic charge or whatever energy they are reflects in the electromagnetic field. And uh, any wireless device uses what's called a magnetometer. And it's a, uh, it has a small bandwidth, not like a, not like a K2 meter or anything like that. But, but it, it if there is interruptions in the EM field around it can show you in, you know, in the space that you're in, if something's going on, allegedly. Now, I, I don't, I'm not uh, a physicist or a scientist. And so I don't know the, the, any more than what I just told you, but, 
we've got some surprising things coming up on there, um, and especially the, the – I just got a REM pod not long ago, and that was squeaking here off air. When I played it on air, it didn't do anything. But I got these little cat balls like this, and they're, they're just motion-activated little cat balls. Mm -hmm. And if they're moved and, – and so they sit, and they sit in here – for hours and days and don't do anything. But last Saturday, one of these went off repeatedly sitting on the table where Don normally sits. And it was pretty incredible. I mean, and, and I would do some, uh, um, uh, well, it's ITC, it's instrumental transcommunication. So it's, it's utilizing a, um, a database of sounds that is believed spirits can form words and some surprising things, including my name came through as well. So, I was pretty impressed, but I've been doing that on Saturdays. Uh, other than that, just doing the normal podcast and the other two episodes, Wednesday and Friday, uh, just having a great time talking about all the strange phenomena. That's awesome. Yeah. Love the show. And I love being there when I can get in there. Uh, the community is awesome. They're always so welcoming. I usually just type something just to let you know I'm there and it just everyone just Hi, Jesse. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Jesse. Yeah, your, your chat is awesome. Our chat is also awesome. And we do have good news for you. Actually, by joining us on this show, you have since earned yourself a degree and you are now a nuclear physicist. Congratulations. That's how easy it is. People don't know this. It's a little hack. So I just don't want you to know this. All you have to do is join Hometown Ghost Stories and boom, you get whatever degree you want. Yep. So I have to make anyway. one I have to make one quick quick correction on on uh, something I said earlier. There is no Tempest Blood So Hotel. When I said that, I was like, that's weird. That's uh, an actress with the same name. It was uh, Tempest Bledsoe was the other actress who witnessed the same haunting that Billy Baldwin witnessed. It sounded oh, like such a cool hotel. It yeah. did. That was a cool name for a minute. We'll open, we'll open that. Yeah, like, one of the actresses from the Cosby <laughs> show. <laughs> oh, funny. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Which gives a, a little more credit to the ghost story, right? If multiple people are experiencing. experiencing so she the saw the thing. bellhop too? Apparently, yeah. Wow. That's what I'm seeing here. Not, uh, wow. Very cool. So there are mm. multiple. For for chat who might be offended, you guys are, are, are the best. All right. <laughs> Paranormal Portal, also really good. You guys are you guys are you guys are number one. Don't worry. Don't worry. Everything's fine. I don't know if we shout out Ricardo for donating uh dollar ninety nine in super chat, but thank you for that. And Matthew Thomas for two dollars as well. Thank you guys for that. I think that's pretty much gonna wrap it. Uh let's thank our patrons real quick for our VIPs. We have Allison V, Jeannie R, Lisa J, Mallory K, Mike Oubliet Blake, Mom and Pops W, Peach Smoothie, Robert H, and Inspires Gaming. We also have 32 DRC, Adam Simmons, who I believe is a new one. So welcome in Adam. If you're not a new one, then I don't know why I didn't know this before, but maybe you changed your name. But Adam, welcome in. Thank you so much. Amby Rose, Anna C, Chris C, Donnie N, Elizabeth Young, Lily, Jake V, Janice G, Matthew T, Papa Squatch, Rachel B, Sarah Cook, Steph A of the COTS. A little update on our name there. Church of the Stephanies. Thank you, Steph. We have Stitch Kitten, Sydney B, the other Rachel B, Al Capone. We have Al Capone's allegedly poorly taxidermy corn dinosaur. Thank you so much. Uh, we have Alicia Espinosa, Anthony T, Brandon W, Brandon B, Kathy McSlugs, Kath Q, Cody G, Huska Castle, Huggy Bear, Joe R, Kiralee J, Mark M, Mariah M, Nuthouse Queen, Paul from St. Louis, Sam from Nepal, Sarah R, Scotty L, Solar Flare, Soph M, Hooper. We also have Swanee. Thank you guys so much for being part of the Patreon. $3 a month. You can be there. Get ad-free episodes, early access, bonus content, all sorts of other stuff. And then for on YouTube, $1 a month, you can join uh, become a member, unlock the emotes. Make sure you guys go check out Paranormal Portal. We will have notes, uh, links in the show notes below. We didn't have them there because if you didn't get this already, we were scrambling to get this episode together, but we got it. Uh, thanks again, Brent. Anything else you want to plug before uh, before we hop? Oh, your, your, your Discord, of course. Yeah, people over in your Discord. We've got a great Discord community too and love to have you over there. But uh, yeah, Discord has been kind of a rising star uh, as far as keeping these chat communities going when the shows aren't on. So definitely join the hometown ghost stories discord. Oh, you plugged our stuff. Thank you. Uh, did you say you have a discord channel as well? Yeah, it's paranormal portal. Yeah. Oh, look at that. All right. Well, send me a link and I'll post that in the show notes as well. And I'm definitely going to join up with yours. Cause that sounds like a great idea. Thank so you. thanks again, Brent guys. My pleasure uh, guys. Thank it. you for having me. Hell yeah. Um, good luck to Rob out there in Las Vegas. Everybody, Keep your fingers crossed. We're going to be hoping that uh, that he absolutely crushes it out there. He already has been crushing it. So thanks again. Uh, and we'll see you guys on Friday. Movie review. We're going to cover Renfield. Renfield. So if you haven't seen that yet, it is a lot of fun. But you have until Friday to go check that out. We'll see you then. Thank you, guys. We'll see you.
What another terrifying episode of Hometown Ghost Stories. I, for one, have goosebumps. Can you see them through the tattoos? Probably not. That's okay. What I need you to do is press that like, that subscribe button, then notify it so that you know when we go live. Sometimes there's secret live shows. That way you can jump in, join the chat. We do these video game streams that I've absolutely never died on. Not once, it's never happened. So if you wanna see that, make sure you're notified. You can also get some merch. Go to hometownghoststories.com, join the Discord. I've pitched everything that we have here. Please help the show out any way that you can, and we will catch you next time here at Hometown Ghost Stories.